Okay, let's start. Um, yeah, as Marshall already pointed out, uh, the finally in the title um, might be misleading. Um, well, we are at a different state than we were uh, four years ago when I also pre presented executors. Um, but we are not done yet, and I'll come to I'll come back to that later. But uh, first, let's start with the beginning. And the beginning of all this uh, might be considered to be the so-called Kona Compromise. And the Kona Compromise uh, comes from a meeting in Kona on Big Island, Hawaii, uh, in 2007, when Herb Sutter asked all the uh, heads of delegation uh, to sit together and really nail down what should be in the next version of C++, C++ which at that time was called C++ OX. Well, and uh, so OX at that time still meant something like uh, X equals nine or something like that. So it was less than two years ago uh, away, so we really needed to decide what we want to have. And for concurrency, the Kona Compromise uh, included a memory model, atomic operations, threads, logs, condition variables, uh, all low-level stuff, and as not such low-level and asynchronous future type. Well, uh, but not include Thread pools, task launching, and read or write logs. And um, well, task launching in the form of uh, async uh, was smuggled in very late. Um, we messed it up, but uh, it's kind of useful anyway. But uh, thread pools, well, they really didn't make it. And now, 10 years later, we still don't have it, them. So this talk is mostly about why we still don't have them. Because if you look at it, it looks pretty easy, but not completely easy. And uh, this is about async. And, uh, it's a very small program, and uh, what does it actually print? Well, this is exactly the point. It always will print hello world. It will never print world hello. And the reason for that is async returns the future. And uh, these drugs, well, it, it might print nothing. So, uh, but it will never print world hello. Maybe because uh, async returns the future, and the future that's returned from async will block. And uh, so it might be deferred, so it will never run the function, or it will block and wait for it. And only then it will go to the next async. And there are very good reasons why async behaves that way. And the reason is lifetime. You, this, this interface, you don't really have any control over the execution agent that actually executes your C out hello. So what happens if this is more or less, uh, these are the uh, last statements in main, and then you wind down, but your async still run. Well, anything can happen, but essentially it's undefined behavior. And to avoid this, it's very important that uh, this cannot happen. And 
the problem is exactly you have no control over the execution agent. So to solve this, you need something that you can control somehow the execution agent on which this uh, task runs. And this is one important aspect of executors. Another motivation is uh, a proposal that came in pretty soon after uh, C++11 was finished. It's a simple pipeline proposal. So you, you have a task that uh, contains several uh, steps, uh, one after the other, but on a lot of data. So you can run it in a pipeline like a normal uh, Unix pipeline. And uh, this specific example uh, was motivated by a presentation, I think at Splash uh, 2009 or something like that. And uh, it modeled a restaurant where some orders come in, then you have some chefs that uh, prepare those orders, then you have some waiters that uh, bring those uh, orders to the guests, and uh, if everything is done, you can close your restaurant. And uh, so it's pretty simple to model that using a pipeline, and uh, because you have a number of chefs and not only one, there is a parallel mechanism, so you can run uh, this task three times and the data actually four times in parallel, if you have any parallelism in your system. So, and, but to run this pipeline, you need something that provides you the execution agent. And in this case, it's a threat pool. And there was actually an uh, implementation of uh, this uh, out on the internet and uh, they also provide a threat pool, and you can run the pipeline on that pool, and everything is fine. Still another motivation is the parallel STL that's actually part of C++17. Because in this case, uh, while you might want to run a lot of execution agents, at the same time. And maybe your executor well, can provide the interface for this one. But again, you just need a mechanism to get execution agents. So this is what are the requirements for an executor. It has to run tasks. That's it simple. And you need to be able to control some lifetime aspects. So you don't get into the async mess again that you actually block on the return uh, from the async. And well, these are not so many requirements. So it shouldn't be hard to come up with a solution for this. So we actually had a proposal in a meeting. It was an SG1 meeting, uh, SG1 only meeting in Redmond in uh, 2012. And there we had a presentation. Well, we actually had two different proposals by Google and by Microsoft, uh, but they were afterwards joined together. And uh, the result of that was essentially this interface. So what you get here is an abstract base class with a more or less one function. And that is just add tasks to that executor. And then the executor is responsible to run those tasks eventually. And well, just for some bookkeeping, there was also another function. And, uh, but essentially, that's it. It's an abstract base class, so there's a virtual uh, function. And uh, then there was also some default executor that you actually could set. So this could, for example, be used for async or things like that. And uh, 
Then there were some concrete executors, uh, a simple thread pool, a thread executor that simply started a new thread for each task that it was given, and uh, then some more or less debugging executors, uh, all of them don't run concurrently your tasks. They just run it serially in different versions. And async uh, could easily use that. Uh, you could even give, uh, either give a special policy, run on an executor, then it runs on the default executor. Well, actually, even the one without an executor, uh, without a special uh, policy, but with a default policy, could probably run on a default executor, uh, as long as it behaves like the old default. And uh, well, of course, this one still has to block on the uh, destruct of the future, but because that is a very important synchronization, uh, synchronization mechanism, and a lot of programs rely on that one. Uh, then, of course, you could give a specific executor to run your task on. The pipeline could also easily be implemented uh, uh, on top of that one, uh, where actually the thread pool was already used. So, fine. Everything done. Uh, this was accepted in uh, the WG21 uh, meeting in Issaquah in 2014. Uh, by SG1 into the concurrent CTS. Well, now we have 2018, we still don't have them, so something happened. And one of that is the abstract base class. Uh, this means you have a virtual function call for each task that you start. If you have a long running task, you don't mind. Uh, if you are not very performance critical, it doesn't matter either. However, there are other cases where you have very small tasks and you have a lot of them and you care about performance. And in those cases, the virtual uh, function interface is simply too costly. However, this interface has a lot of merit because uh, it gives you a stable binary interface. So you can provide libraries as binary libraries, and they can take any executor because the binary interface is always the same. It's the abstract base class. So some people really want that because they need the binary stability, and others really don't want it because it simply costs too much. So this was one of the problems. And uh, so we got pretty soon new proposals. And one was based on the ACO work by Chris Kohlhoff. And uh, that had a problem uh, of very small tasks and still uh, performance critical. So we, he really didn't want the uh, virtual function interface. So uh, he decided to come up with something completely different, completely template-based. And, uh, and also a uh, separation between an execution context that actually runs all your tasks and has all the machinery, and the executor on the other side, which is more or less just a handle. But that handle could have some additional information, some additional state, or whatever. 
And uh, based on this, we again had a number of concrete uh, executors, uh, the system executor, which was essentially like the thread executor, uh, thread pool, which was essentially the same as the, the previous one, and the strand, which was essentially the serial executor. And uh, this had a number of uh, customization points to care about a lot of information that you may want to give your executor. To give the executor a chance to um, perform your tasks as uh, performant as possible. So the communication mechanism of those execution agents were not the futures, but something that were called continuation tokens. And those continuation tokens could be of the future, but it could also be something different, which might be much more performant. And, uh, And then this could, could just uh, give you some information. Another customization point was it did not only have one single uh, function to give a task to an executor, but three different ones. And the first two ones are uh, very different because uh, the dispatch function could actually run your task right away in line. So this could actually block on the uh, finish of your task. <coughs> However, the post function was not allowed to block. This really had to go to a queue or whatever. Uh, the post function always had to return directly. Well, might still have some blocking for synchronization on enqueuing something, but it is not allowed to block on uh, the finish of the task that you give it. And then there was a defer function, which was very um, non-intuitive to a lot of people, because uh, what was said right from the beginning is that you could uh, implement defer by just calling post. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is uh, defer is more or less just a performance hint. It's a performance hint to the executor that uh, the task that is given with the defer function is a continuation of the current task. And the current task is still running so launching it right away on some new thread doesn't really make a lot of sense because that thread actually has to block first uh, for the current task to finish. So it would be OK to implement it by post, but uh, it would not be as efficient as possible. So this is more or less just a performance hint. And then it had a very special mechanism where you actually could ask the task that was given to you. So the executor could ask uh, the control structure, actually, that used the executor, and uh, the control structure that actually got some task from you could ask your task, what is the associated executor for this specific task? I will come back to that later, because that gives you a lot of mechanisms uh, to transfer additional information to the executor. Well, so this was one proposal. Another proposal was more or less just a new revision of the original uh, Google and Microsoft proposal. And uh, that just uh, went away with the virtual function. So the performance uh, 
critique of uh, the virtual function call uh, was not there anymore, but otherwise it was more or less just the same. And then there was a different proposal, which was not really an executive proposal, but kind of, and that came from NVIDIA, because they tried to implement the parallel STL. And for that, of course, they also needed uh, execution agents, so they needed some executors, but they found that uh, the interface well, the very small interface was not good enough, but uh, this also wasn't good enough. So they came up with a different proposal. Uh, well, the way it worked was it actually worked as traits. So uh, the idea was that those traits could adapt an existing executor uh, in a form that you got additional interfaces, but only if the original executor didn't provide those functions. And uh, so the, the idea was that uh, you really cared about performance and maybe had special hardware like, like a GPU. Uh, you provide special interfaces but uh, you could also give a normal executor, and then the traits would adapt that normal executor to your required interface. And one of the important things here uh, was to start more than one task at once. And this is, especially if you have a GPU with, with a lot of cores, uh, then you might want uh, a thousand uh, tasks at the same time, and doing that with a for loop is simply very slow. So this was very specific to uh, parallel algorithms, but it was an important use case. And uh, it not only introduced the bike interface, but it also said, well, we also need some result. So the uh, original proposal didn't return anything from the spawn or from the add function, but it was actually your task uh, to provide something inside of that function uh, to give you any result if a result is desired. So the parallel Orgles and people said, well, this is not good enough. We really need something to get back. And so the only thing we had at that time was the future. But they said from the beginning, well, we don't only want to, uh, we don't want uh, to support only the future, but also other future types. So essentially what, what we came up with were more requirements to executors. And uh, this is essentially because executors are considered to be some base building block. It's not really considered uh, to be something that is used by normal application programmers, but it's a building block. And you want to build different control structures on top of those executors. Like you build containers and allocators, uh, you want to build something like async or parallel algorithms or ACO or pipeline or whatever on top of executors. So you have a lot of different control structures and those have different needs, different requirements to your executors. But this is only one part of the story. If you write an application, you might want to use such a control structure. But you provide the executor like you can provide the allocator 
for the container, and you provide the application. And now you might want to transfer specific information from the application to the executor, but you cannot change the control structure in the middle. And this is exactly where the get associated executor comes in, because that way you can add additional information to your tasks uh, without changing anything inside of the control structure. And then there was also that then, uh, where it's also not completely clear where the continuation actually runs. So it also has an executor interface. Uh, ASIO, I already mentioned that one. And more or less all complaints about the original design was, well, executors is very often about parallelism. Parallelism is about performance. And, uh, well, you really need to be able to provide specific executors for specific hardware, for specific purposes that have a very high performance output and still fit into the executor model so that you can use any control structures on top of it. And uh, that's the reason why uh, we need a different interface. And uh, well, one of the points is, do you need a return value or not? Or do you need a handle to the work or not? And the other one is, um, well, do you need a bulk interface? So you want to spawn a lot of tasks at the same time. Uh, do you want to give additional scheduling info like the defer function? Uh, do you require specific, uh, specific progress guarantees or whatever? There needs to be a mechanism uh, to give this information to the executor. So you need a special interface for that one. And here we have a different example. So this is partly based on the pipeline, but it's not really a serial pipeline, but it's more uh, Y-shaped, because this actually has two inputs it reads from, and then it feeds those two inputs into the same pipeline, and uh, those two inputs might be some sensors or whatever, and uh, then you have a step that validates your data, maybe, maybe filter it uh, somehow, and then you want to store it for later analysis or whatever. And uh, so if the original input comes from hardware, it might be that one of those hardware devices actually uh, has a very small buffer. So you really need to get that input as soon as it's available. So you want to give that a real-time priority, while the other input is not very critical, so that can go the normal priority and all the rest can run on a normal thread pool. But this specific input path, this should really have a higher priority. So you, now you don't have a single executor for all steps in your pipeline. But what you actually have is you have a wrap function, and uh, you wrap one of your tasks with a specific executor. And this is a real-time executor with a high priority. And now you can 
inside of your pipeline implementation, you can ask using get associated executor, what's the executor for a specific task? And so you can run it differently on a different executor. So this is one of the reasons why you might want things like get associated executor. And again, the more info you can uh, give your executor, the more performant it may be able to perform the actual tasks. So one of the information is, uh, well, what's the relationship of the task that you give to it to your current task? Like it's a continuation. Also, it's a is it a long-running or a short-running task? For a long-running task, it might make sense to spawn off a new operating system thread. For a short-running task, well, just give it to a thread pool that runs all your other short-running tasks. Is it allowed to block on the uh, finish of your task, or is it not allowed? Will this task come again and again? As you have seen before, do you have specific priority uh, requirements? <coughs> do you want a return value? There are a lot of information that are important for an executor to know. Some of that is between the control structure and the executor, and some of that is between the application and the executor. So yeah, I already talked about rep. That is a mechanism to, uh, and this where the difference between the execution context and the executor comes in. Because the execution context, that is your thread pool or whatever you have to actually run your task. And the executor itself is only a very lightweight thing. But you can put additional information on this one. And the web and get associated executor is especially a mechanism to transfer information from the application to the executor through the control structure, without the control structure actually knowing about that one. And as I said, this was part of uh, Chris Kohler's proposal, and it was actually part of the networking tiers, and still is. So we had those different proposals, and uh, they really didn't merge, so the status quo at the uh, meeting in Oulu in uh, June 2016 was essentially, well, as I said, we had the original proposal uh, in the concurrency TS, but uh, then just a few months later in the Robertsville meeting, uh, all the other non-concurrency and not parallelism people came into SG1 and said, well, no, it doesn't work that way, and we really need something different. So in Rappersville, it was decided, OK, uh, we, we don't want the original proposal anymore. And uh, we would like to start with Chris Korloff's proposal. However, uh, probably still needs a number of changes. So this was mainly in favor, this was mainly in favor, and this one was really split because a lot of people thought, well, uh, Chris Collar's proposal is not really baked yet. And, uh, 
Well, this was a full SG1 uh, WT21 meeting, and then SG1 decided to have a special meeting again in Redmond in uh, September 2014, and SG1 is a very specific mix of people, because uh, in SG1 there are nearly only parallelism people. There are nearly no concurrency people. And those people actually said, well, we can actually live with the original uh, Google proposal, which was uh, then Chris Mason's proposal. So they decided, well, we would really not use Chris Kohler's proposal, but we would really like to use Chris Mason's proposal. But they knew, OK, that this will never really uh, work with the other people from WG21. So uh, there was no real progress. And uh, so in June uh, 2016, Michael Wong came and said, well, um, we really need to start to work together. Uh, this is more or less what I already showed. And, uh, but before I come uh, to the joint proposal, um, there's still something else. And uh, the, the point is, whenever you do blocking, you are more or less wasting resources. And uh, well, of course, while you block, the operating system can schedule another task. But uh, this involves the operating system and uh, is actually pretty costly. And uh, so it's actually better if you don't block. And one mechanism is boost ASIO or the networking TS. And another option is actually co-routines or gore routines. So uh, co-routines can be also a concurrency mechanism. So it, it might be useful to run, for example, a pipeline not on different threads, but on different tasks uh, that are cooperatively scheduled, so on different coroutines. The problem of the uh, coroutines that are currently in the coroutines TS, uh, and which are sometimes called gore routines, uh, is that that mechanism doesn't really work well with executors in the sense that you cannot build out of them an executor interface that you can give, for example, to a pipeline or to a, a parallel for loop or whatever. However, it's still useful, so this is an ASIO proposal or networking TS proposal. Uh, this is the original one, and uh, it actually takes some time to understand what it does. Uh, though it's actually pretty easy, it's just the echo part of a ping, of a network ping. So essentially, whatever you get, you send back. In the normal way, this would be different functions. In the gore routine uh, way, it's one single function, and it can have a useful name. And uh, then it just co-evades the read, and then co-evades the write. And this inside of, of a while loop, and everything is fine. So using co-routines, using gore routines is actually pretty useful. And uh, it can actually be extremely cheap uh, in, in terms of uh, CPU cycles. But as I said, uh, it works nicely with ASIO. It doesn't work with generally 
uh, with this general con uh, concurrent control structures because you cannot really build an executor on top of it. So in Ulu, Michael Wong said, well, those people who work on executors really need to work together. So he started a phone call every two weeks uh, where all those different uh, persons working on an uh, executive proposal actually talked together and their task was to come up with a common joint proposal. I, I was also invited, but, but unfortunately, uh, the main persons on that call came from the US West Coast or from Australia. So they decided to schedule that call on Saturday morning at 2 o'clock. And the time might have been possible for me, but uh, not the day. That is weekend for me. So, but the others actually worked pretty well together. So they came up with a unified proposal. Uh, already in November 2016. So within four months, they actually came up with a common proposal. And it was more or less a merger of the Chris Koloff proposal and of the NVIDIA proposal. And it had 16 different execution functions to care for all those different things you might to want to inform your ex executor about. So, uh, SG1 decided, well, it might be useful, but we, we, we don't really like that. So, uh, then they sat together again on the phone, and uh, so they came up uh, the completely restructured proposal, and you could do essentially the same as with those 16 different execution functions, and you could actually do much more with them, but with a completely different approach. And uh, that was more or less uh, accepted by uh, SG1 in Albuquerque last November, and uh, we, we had an update on this uh, just uh, three weeks ago in Jacksonville. However, th that was inside of SG1. In the, inside of uh, the Library Evolution Working Group, uh, there were a lot of discussion. Uh, and I will come back to that one. Uh, so this was the original proposal with 16 different execution functions. So the simple one was execute. This was just the original spawn or add function. Uh, you give it a task, and it just runs that task. It doesn't return anything. Well, um, Sometimes you want something back, and that, who? I actually forgot which one it is. I think this one actually returns a future. And then you also have the defer version, because, yeah, it, it, can be the same as this one, but uh, no, no, the, the point is, yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, the, 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 it has a combination. First, one of them was blocking, one of them was non-blocking, uh, one, one of them returned the future, one of them didn't return a future, and then there was also the, the defer, uh, well, to give the executor the hint that uh, it shouldn't uh, schedule the task right away. 
And this was for the single functions, and then you also had the bulk interface, uh, where you wanted a lot of functions, and uh, then you also had the then execute interface, where you first waited on a future before you started either a single function or a lot of functions. And with all those combinations, you got Actually, you could get more than 16 functions, but they said, well, 16 functions are good enough for now. But yeah. as I said, they are way too many. So they came up with a completely different approach. And uh, so they actually boiled it down to the actually different interface. So this is simple uh, execute and uh, it's just like the original spawn or add function, it doesn't return anything. If you want a future back, you have to call two-way execute. And if you first want to wait on the completion of another task, you have to call then execute and give it additionally a future. And then come the bulk versions, also three of them, uh, where you actually say, okay, you want a lot of tasks. And um, what all those uh, parameters mean, um, I actually show on the bulk two-way execute. And it's, it actually has a lot of arguments. First is a function you want to run. And then, it's the shape, it's actually the number of tasks you want one. The idea is that in the future, uh, you might actually uh, want to support multi-dimensional shapes. So typically, you run this on data that's laid out in memory some way, and uh, Right now, you just say, okay, the task number one that uh, has to work on the first part of this memory, task number two has to work on the second part of the, of the memory, and so on. And if you have a two-dimensional shape, uh, then you get actually your two dimensions, and uh, you, you have to figure out which part of data uh, is the one that you should work on. And this one is given to the function. Well, the index of this one. And then you have a result factory. But because this is a two-way, you are interested in the results. Well, do you want one result? Or do you want a lot of results? Well, that depends on the function you have. If it's a reduction function or a search function, you only want one result. Well, it might be a modification function where you actually want for each input an output. So the idea is that you actually return one single future type and this is provided by something that's called the result factory. Uh, and this factory uh, provides the result mechanism that is used for this specific function. So when you call this function, you need to know what kind of function f is and what kind of result you want so that you can set up a result factory. And the result factory actually provides the final result, but
but it's actually run before all the Fs start. Because this thing that is provided by the result factory is given by reference also to the function. So it's a job of the function to decide, OK, uh, this is how I return my result. And it gets the place where it should put the result. And whether it requires any reduction or not is, again, part of that function. And uh, well, the other thing is, on what data should that function run? All those functions that you give here don't take any arguments. So you need to provide the argument by lambda capture or some other way. And for the bulk interface, this some other way might actually be an additional factory which provides one single shared parameter for all those tasks. So what this function actually does it is it creates shape, which is more or less just an n, just as I t. So it uh, creates n execution agents. And in each of those execution agents, it calls the function f with an index. So there's a current index. Then the thing that came from the result factory and the thing that came from the shared parameter factory. And then those functions can cooperate on uh, how to actually deal with the data and provide the result. So of course, a normal executor wouldn't provide that function. And this is exactly the point. The requirement, the formal requirement on executor is that it's copy constructible without going any exceptions. It's equality comparable, again without any exceptions. And it provides at least one of those six execution functions. So I can have an executor that only provides this one. And the idea is, and uh, that actually was, at some time in the proposal, uh, it went out for whatever reason, just by mistake, uh, of the current version of the proposal, but it will go back in. So the idea is, whenever you say you want something else, the other function that you don't provide is more or less uh, provided by an adaptation mechanism. OK, so here we have six functions. But uh, previously, we had 16 functions. So how can we get the semantics of those 16 functions back with those six functions. Well, the mechanism is properties. So executors have properties. And some of those properties define what is the available syntactic interface. So, is it a one-way? So it provides the normal execute. Is it a two-way interface? 
So uh, it provides the two-way execute, or is it a continuation interface, so it provides then execute. Those are different properties, and one single executor could have all of them, or just one of them. And then the cardinality, the single and the bulk version, then the blocking behavior, it's never blocking, it's always uh, blocking, or it's possibly blocking. Uh, then for the defer, we, we need to inform whether it's a continuation or not. Uh, it might be useful to say, well, uh, if you have an execution agent, don't throw it away because uh, there is more work uh, to come. Uh, what are the progress guarantees? Um, what is the behavior with respect to thread local storage? So uh, does it always create a new thread? Uh, is it mapped to something like a std thread? So is uh, the thread local storage stable? Or can it actually migrate between different std threads? So you cannot really rely on uh, thread local storage. And then there, there is a special uh, property uh, because uh, some of those things have actually uh, have to allocate uh, memory. So you can give them an allocator to allocate that memory. And these are just the standard properties. But your control structure could define additional properties, or your executor could define additional properties. And the way to get those properties is require or prefer. Well, require says, okay, I really need this property, Prefer means, okay, I, I would like that property, but, but uh, if you don't have it, don't mind, I can live without it. So the defer, the continuation property, would, something, would be something that you typically only prefer, while having a two-way uh, execute is something you really need to require, because otherwise you just cannot call that function. Uh, so there's actually a difference be between which properties are only requirable and which properties are also preferable. And uh, if you don't provide a prefer, it will fall back to require if you have that one. And what you say is, you say require, give it an executor, and then you give it all the properties you want to have. Yes? A uh, uh, property can be, uh, I will show an uh, uh, example. Uh, in just a few minutes, but a property is just a tag type. And because you need to uh, give it as argument also a value of that tag type, but typically it's an empty struct uh, and then just one uh, object of it. So it's not something like a bit mask. And that is why we have this interface. So, and it, this way, you know, okay, you will have an execute function, uh, and it will never block on the execution of the task. Um, for two-way execution, it's easy, you get a future back. It may not be a stood future, uh, 
but you get something back that you can wait on. For one-way execution, you don't have any handle. You have no idea when it was finished. Um, there was some discussion about that. Uh, I think this essentially has died down now. So uh, I think that is more or less accepted. Uh, however, uh, there is a big discussion right now going on. Uh, okay, what should that future actually should look like? So. Uh, what is the minimal interface uh, th that we need for that future, and how can we achieve something that has as few synchronization as possible? So this is uh, very up uh, on discussion still. Uh, and what's also not discussed yet, but which is actually pretty important is, Futures have two ends. It's the one part that provides the value and the other part that actually uh, wants to use that value and waits on that value. Those need to synchronize. Well, if you go back to my data concentrator, one of those executors is a high priority operating system threat, essentially. The others might be on some kind of coroutine. So how do you synchronize between those? What's the common future type of those two different executor types? And uh, this is really completely up in the air still. So this is not solved yet. And uh, one of the point of one-way execution is you need a mechanism uh, how you can actually, well, track uh, not as an application, but as an executor, or as the things that, that actually uh, executes those tasks, uh, there you actually need to track those things. And that is where actually the execution context comes in. The execution context was in the joint proposal for quite some time. Uh, it's not anymore in the latest version of the proposal. Uh, because some executors simply don't need it. Uh, but as soon as you have a real executor that does actually real work, you need something like an execution context. So what we have now is something that you can use more or less for experimentation. And uh, to make it a little bit clearer what all that means, it's probably best to show some code. And uh, the first one is just how to use that require. So essentially what we have here is a template function that is a template on the executor. So we have no idea what the executor, well, actually, can you read that in the back? OK. Uh, so you have no idea what kind of executor that is. So you simply say, OK, you want uh, two-way because you want to have a result. So this is what you do. Uh, this is some mechanism that was uh, well proposed by Eric Niebler um, to first say using 
the normal require that that's provided by the library, but then call the require without any scoping so that if you have your own require, it will be picked up. And if you don't have your own require, then it will pick up the one from the library. So this require, in this case, it just will take the one from the library, and uh, you say you want a two-way uh, executor. If this doesn't work, you will get a compile time failure. And I here use a normal X term, with, which has a buffer of 500 lines, and the error message that I got here didn't fit into those 500 lines. <laughs> but that's a different question. Exactly, but, but uh, this is not based on concepts yet. Uh, as soon as we standardize that, it will be a concept, yes. So, yes, you say, yeah, well, 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 I, it, it may not be a concept. And uh, I will come back to that one. Um, so now we have actually know, okay, this uh, TWExec is a two-way executor, so it has two-way execute. So now I can uh, add tasks to it and get back some future, and then I just can get out uh, the values, and everything is fine. And so how to use uh, this function? Well, you have a, a thread pool. A thread pool is not an executor in this model. It's an execution context. So you first need to get an executor out of the execution context, and then you can call uh, the function with this executor, and the member function executor just will give you an executor. And that's it. So this is how require works. The idea is, if your thread pool only provides a simple one-way execute, this require will provide a wrapper that actually provides the two-way version. It doesn't work in the current proposal and in the current implementation of the proposal. I actually uh, use the implementation more or less by Chris Kohlhoff uh, that's available on GitHub. And, uh, However, I use not the latest branch for a number of reasons. Uh, and, but but that, that branch, which is R4, that doesn't have the adapting require, and the current branch doesn't have it either, but, but the final version will quite probably have it. So you can have a very simple executor with a single function, and the require will provide the adaptions for you if you really need them. Of course, it always makes sense to provide the functions yourself if that provides some better performance. But if you're running on stiff threads, for example, anyway, uh, the only thing you could do with a bulk interface would be uh, just to do a for loop, and that can be done by the adapter. So it doesn't make sense if you provide your own bulk version. Okay, so that is how require actually works. So the next one is, well, the simple executor, and I actually use uh, the version from Chris, uh, Chris Kohlhoff, and this is just an inline executor. 
And remember, it must be uh, equally compar uh, equality comparable. So you need the equality uh, compare operator and also the not equal. Uh, in this case, it just uh, always returns it's equal. What's the idea of this uh, equality comparable? The idea is that you um, know when you have two different executors whether they are interchangeable or not. So if they compare equal, uh, you can launch your task on any of those executors. So essentially, if they uh, have the same execution context behind and more or less the same properties, then they typically compare equal. So, and so this is the only one you need, and then you need, uh, of course, the execution function, and because this is an inline executor, you just call the function. That's it. And this is the old version, uh, so you still have to pro provide the context member function. You don't have to provide that in the latest version. And, uh, well, that's it. There's actually uh, trade is one-way executor, and it is. So this is a simple executor. Another executor that is also by uh, Chris Korloff, and I just adapted it a little bit, is a wrapping executor. So you have an underlying executor that actually does the work, but you wrap it, in this case, for logging. So, so when you start it, you uh, print out something, uh, and uh, when you finish it, uh, you also print out something. So um, this is my logging executor, and it's based on the uh, wrap executor, so, so the uh, inner executor. And uh, there's a helper function, my wrap function, that essentially just uh, before I call the function, uh, it prints something out. Then it has a setup with a destructor to print something out at the end. Uh, and then it just calls the function. And uh, this is used here in the execute function, uh, where I just call the execute of the inner executor with my wrapper. So it first prints something, then calls a function, and then prints something again. That's it. And it has to do that for execute and uh, two-way execute, because uh, right now it cannot synthesize the two-execute version. And for any require, and here you see how the require can work, uh, is you actually provide the require function as a member function and the global require function uh, will pick up it, and you more or less just forward it to your inner executor. And then you, again, need the uh, equality uh, comparison, where you actually check, is your wrapped executor equal, and is your prefix the same? And if yes, you can launch your task on either one. Otherwise, you should really the one that you got given. And that's it. That's uh, another executor. And I can use that 
just saying, okay, uh, I want a logging executor based on my uh, thread pool. And uh, then I require the one way and execute on it just a simple task. Well, now I might want to require a logging executor. So I want to provide my own user-specified property. Oh. So one way to do this, and it doesn't really work this way anymore in the latest version. That is why I still use uh, R4. Uh, they have changed something, and uh, it's not clear whether they will change it back or not. So right now I just uh, tell this mechanism. Uh, the other version of that will not be much different. But uh, so the, the, the idea is you just provide a global require function. Well, it doesn't need to be global. It just needs to be found by uh, argument-dependent lookup. And, uh, and you give it an executor. And you say, OK, you want this specific property. And this is how the property looks like. It's just an empty struct. And we have one object of it. So we, give, we can give this one uh, to this function, and the require will just return a logging executor that wraps the given executor. Marshall? Um, this may be. I'm, I'm not completely sure, but because, uh, yeah, well, I, I didn't do it completely because this is the part I did myself, so this is not by Chris Koloff. Uh, they actually have in their uh, document, but not in the code, only the document, uh, that they show uh, how they do it, and uh, they, they actually do it as a member function of the logging executor, and uh, that way they, they can decide, well, if it's the logging property, then I handle it myself, and if it's any other property, I just uh, defer it to the inner executor. But the general mechanism still works this way. So, uh, Using this, I can actually say, OK, I have my executor from the pool, and I require from this one the a logging executor. And then on this one, I require the one way. And then I call the execute on the new one. It actually should also work uh, putting the logging exec and the one way uh, into one call of the require. Um, but if I do anything wrong, I get much more than 500 lines of code of error message. So I prefer to do it this way. Um, but this is how properties work. So, and it's actually, as I've shown you, it's actually pretty easy to define your own specific uh, properties. And this can be done either by the control structure or by the executor. How would you specify your own prefixes? This it's also possible. Uh, I don't have an example of it, and to be honest, I 
don't know exactly what the mechanics there are. However, there already is a property that requires an argument, which is the allocator property. So the mechanism is there. Uh, I just don't know right now how to do that. Probably you just have a require with, with an extra argument. Uh, so it's possible, but I cannot show you the exact syntax right now. And as I said, it has changed anyway uh, in the current version, so it might change again in the future. So here, I'm here to present the concept and to show examples how you can use it, not the actual details. But it's possible. In this case, I just use a, a auto, yeah, but uh, there is a mechanism that you could provide your own one. Yeah? Um, this is a very good point. Uh, and at that point, well, I actually have uh, also an example where I show an implementation of this data concentrator. Uh, it actually works. And uh, so the, the point is I don't have the get associated executor right now, so I cannot use the web. However, what I do is I use a property on the task. So I just say, okay, I have a require uh, on my task, and uh, the data concentrator just uh, that does a require on the task, and uh, I have a general one which just gives the original executor, and uh, then I can just put my require for my specific lambda in my case, and uh, that provides the spe uh, specific executor. But uh, looking at the time, I will not show you the code. However, I, uh, here are more properties that, are, uh, that, that may come or may not come. And uh, so one point, and this is exactly your question, and then that is uh, why executors will probably not be in C++20, uh, because there's still a lot of discussion going on. Uh, one of that is on the future type and how to organize work between two completely different kinds of executors. Uh, and... Uh, one of them is actually how to use the require in a virtual function world. So when you actually want to have the uh, binary interface, and that is why the require, uh, even in the final version, may not be a concept thing because the concept doesn't work with virtual functions. And this was exactly one of the big discussions with uh, the Library Evolution Working Group, because there are people who really want the uh, polymorphic interface to work. And uh, the common solution is uh, you, you actually... Um, put the require in the, so, so the requirements here, are, I think, are in the type of the executor. So you essentially make your executor base class a template on the required properties. So, so you are guaranteed that uh, the require actually succeeds. But, uh, yeah, you can really see it's an add-on. Because those people that, that really worked on the executor, well, they live more or less in template world. So they are fine with compile time uh, polymorphism. Uh, and those people who really need the runtime polymorphism, uh, well, yeah, the, the, the solution is there, but, but there is nearly no experience with it. Um, so 
yeah, th this is a reason why uh, we will quite probably put it into a, a technical specification pretty soon. Uh, but that means it will not be finished in time for C20. Unfortunately, this means uh, that the networking TS will not will also not be part of C20. Um, yeah, there was a vote uh, in, in Jacksonville three weeks ago, and nearly everybody thought, well, we really shouldn't go forward with the networking uh, library without having the executor library. Actually, I believe it would have been possible ju just to have the executor as an OPEC type and uh, the networking library just provides one single one, so you could actually use all the networking function. You could not provide your own executors, uh, but, but that would be an add-on later, but the general sentiment was, okay, we don't want this version. So probably everything will be in C23. Okay, the, the code and the presentation will be at some time on my website. And uh, there are also all the references to the different proposals and to the implementation. So are there any more questions? So it's hard to understand you. Just wrap the computer. So it is still possible to wrap the original one, right? Um, so your question essentially is uh, you, you have a thread uh, or you have an executor, yeah. and uh, the wrapping function will still, or the essentially the get associated executor uh, will still. Uh, return the original uh, executor and will not wrap anything. Is that your question? No, I mean that once you wrap that uh, hmm? into the two way property, you can have still access to that original uh, executor. So no, it. no, no. So once you, uh, you, you have called require, it will return you a new executor. And uh, there is no way, and you can again require the original property, but that might still give you a new one. So it's, uh, there is currently no way that you actually can go back to the original one. Uh, but you, you, you can have that original one right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, if you look at my examples, you always have the uh, thread pool more or less, and uh, you have the uh, one that, that was returned from require. However, if you look at this function, here you only get uh, the executor, and if that was already the result of the require, you cannot get here the original executor back. And in most cases, it doesn't really matter because it's all based on the same execution context, so it's based on the same thread pool or whatever, uh, so it doesn't really matter. But in cases where it matters, uh, you need to be careful to actually give your function or control structure or whatever you call all the information it needs. Okay, but my question is uh, about uh, once you wrap that uh, exit, uh, you have exit, yeah. you can by the accident run the execute of the exit. Um, 
the, the, the point is only the TW exact, well, yeah, 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 so, so, that's true. Cool. Uh, even the original one might already have been a two-way executor, so it might have the two-way execute, and uh, if you run it on that one, uh, you run it on the original one and not on the web one. Yeah, that, that's true. So, I would say I finish here. If there are any more questions, I will be around for five minutes more or something like that. Thank you.